Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, we ask you that you would draw near to our hearts, Father, as we worship you. Touch our bodies. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would even heal bodies, Lord, that are hurting or in pain or sick in the midst of worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
God shines forth, he speaks and summons the whole earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting out of Zion, out of Zion. God shines forth, he speaks and summons the whole earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting out of Zion, out of Zion. God shines forth, he speaks and summons the whole earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting out of Zion, out of Zion. God shines forth, he speaks and summons the whole earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Is there anyone worthy to open the scroll, to loose its seals? Yes, there is only one, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Jesus, He is worthy. He is worthy.
You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone, you alone deserve our name above all names.
gladness for Jacob, the joining the song of heaven, longing for the return of your people to the home, to your home. Father, we ask that you would reveal your love to them, God, that you sent your only son. Abba, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are revealing and you are releasing an increase even now amongst your people. Ah, but we say, let hope arise. Let hope arise again that their Messiah is coming. We love you, Jesus. We're longing for your return. We love you. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, worship leader. Amen. Let's go ahead and remain standing for just a moment. We're going to have the IHOPKC mission statement put up on the screens. We recite this together on Friday evenings. The IHOPKC community exists to partner in the Great Commission by advancing 24-7 prayer with worship by proclaiming the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's take a moment and greet one another. Just turn to the person next to you, behind you. Tell them your first name. Okay, let's go ahead and grab a seat. If, there's very few, you have an empty seat by you, if you'd raise your hand up and just kind of wave it because we got a handful of folks looking for a seat. Hey, keep those hands up high. We got a few folks looking for seats. Okay, if you're young and able and you want to sit up front on the floor, oh, the enthusiasm went down. Come on up if you want to. Just to, if you think, hey, I like sitting on the floor. It's I only, believe. yeah, whoa. This, it's only if you're young and able, not if you're humble. Because if we no. see any of our humble, elderly community coming up here, we are going to send you back. I don't know. You're kind of borderline. Uh, iffy. Okay, this is you're not good. a you're humility good. contest. Anybody okay. that wants to, if you like sitting on the floor, which I don't. Yeah. 
Then if, if seats are opening up, just wave your hand because we have some folks standing along the back, it looks like. And okay, keep those hands up looking. high for just yeah. a moment. Okay, let's look at the bulletin, a couple quick announcements. Number one, Sunday, typically we have two services, you know that. This Sunday, we only have one, 10 o'clock. The reason is because tomorrow, May 27th and May 28th, the 100 million intercessors across the world in different time zones, it's over 26 hours from Asia all the way through the Middle East and the, uh, uh, Europe all the way through. It's 26 hours, 100 million intercessors committing to one hour for the day, some will do more, so it's a 26 hour period. And so we're going to, uh, it starts tomorrow night because it's, it's- In Israel time. It's it May 28th, 28th over there. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I'm a little brain dead right now. It's, <laughs> thank you, Isaac. Over there. This is, and so we're having a simulcast, meaning a number of TV stations. We're showing it all across the world. And it ends over in Israel the evening for the nightfall, it ends at 10 a.m. here to 12. So they asked us, would you mind being a part of ending it with us? This 21 day fast and the 26 hours of the 100 million, could we end it? And you uh, guys in Kansas City, it's 10 to 12, you gotta put your two services together. And we said? We said yes. We said yes. <laughs> so it will be just a little bit more full than it is tonight. It will be. Uh. What are we doing on the GPR station? Yeah, the GPR is open. Ooh, it is? Yeah. Say it so I don't say it wrong. Yeah, the, <laughs> I'll be the one to get the emails. So I said this last week, but if giant crowds and jammed capacity is not your thing. It's the, not my thing. The no. global prayer room will be open for those that would like to be down there and, and finish out the fast down there. So we're gonna put everything on the screens down there. We're gonna take the worship team and we're gonna have a, we're gonna keep the fire on the altar so the worship team will be going, but not on that stage. So what's happening on these screens will be happening down there as well. So if you think I want a little more space, a little more parking, I think I'm just gonna go down there tomorrow morning. That's, uh, of course, we're on all night, clear to the end of the fast. The fast ends on Sunday at, at noon. But if you want to stay down there, everything we're doing here, it's, again, we're going to a number different, we're going to Jerusalem, we're going here, we're going to the Truman property, a few other places around the world for five and 10 minutes at a time, different leaders like Asher and Trader in Jerusalem and a number of others. Lots of small segments for two hours because we're doing this together. We're ending the 21 day fast across the globe and we're ending the 26 uh, hours of the 100 million intercessors and it all ends literally on our time, 10 a.m. To, to 12. So we really want to be a part of that. But if you'd like a little more space and a little more parking, just stay down in the prayer room, get there early. Did you mention that's going to be interactive here? Yes. On that morning between here us and, and Truman Jerusalem. property and yeah. Jerusalem, five and 10 minute segments, a bunch of them across the world. Fantastic. So, uh, because we want to celebrate with, this is a huge historic thing that's happened. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Number two, we have wisely merged the Global Bridegroom Fast in June. We merged it into May. Now, if you insist on fasting Monday to Wednesday, then Isaac is going to be leading you. <laughs> Straight to the counseling room. Straight to the counseling room. No, so this week we're not having, because we are we figured... We did it, right? Did we do it? We did it. We did it, okay. We're, we're dragging ourselves to the end. <laughs> yes. Some more than others. All right, let's just Okay, number on. three, <laughs> next Friday night is our final six o'clock so we can do a debriefing as a community. What happened in May 2023? It's a historic time. So we have one more of these nights, Friday night, six o'clock. We're merging the two services on Friday to the one. And then the next week, we're jumping back into the John 13 to 17. We're gonna do it throughout the summer with the exception of we have a few Friday nights where the, the uh, teens and the camps 
are doing some things on Friday night, but mostly through the summer, myself and Stuart, we're going back on Friday night, 7.30, to the intimacy with the Trinity. John 16 is what we're on. We interrupted John 16 because uh, somebody called a fast or something for it was me. you. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so we interrupted uh, that John 16 series. We're gonna pick it up through the summer. Again, a few of the, probably three or four of the Friday nights in the next 10 weeks will be related to our camps. Because when our teens are here, we want to talk to them directly and not just, you know, put them on session 13 on John 16. They're going like, what? what? So we're going to do things more focused on them. So that's a little bit of, a, of what's going to be happening in the summer. Talk to us about the Israel Fund. How about you? Okay. Let's put up the slide How, for wait, that. Wait, is anybody in this room tired? Wave your hand if you're tired. You're happy, but you're tired. <laughs> I saw a lot of hands go down. <laughs> The wrongs are too tired. <laughs> no, I'm just a little, I'm wixing my merds up pretty yeah. much. <laughs> Number five, really we had it in our heart at the beginning of this fast in the spirit of Isaiah 58 verse six that talks about the fast being part of undoing the heavy burdens as we release finances, as we sow into different ministries. So we opened up this Israel fund for folks to give to, th those that are online, those in our room, in our community. It's open. It's been open throughout the fast. You can take a uh, QR code there. Just pull out your phone and scan that if you'd like to. And really, our heart is to receive this offering, and 100% of it is going to be sown into ministries that are ministering in the land of Israel. And we want to be a part of that undoing the heavy burdens, some of the financial pressures that various people are under. But I'm, I'm stirred by what Paul says in Romans chapter 15 and in verse 27, because he says that the Gentiles are debtors to the Jews because of the spiritual things that they've sown into us. We reap the benefit as Gentiles spiritually from what the Lord began with the nation of Israel. And then Paul says, is it not too much to sow material things back into them? So we reap the spiritual things and we sow material things and so in the spirit of that, we are doing this Israel fund. And I wanna encourage you to ask the Lord, Lord, what could I sow into this fund to bless our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel that are laboring, that are under so much pressure, there's so much hostility on so many levels. What can I do to be a part of undoing heavy burdens as we sow these material things into I'm them? I'm gonna go a little bit more on that verse in, in uh, Romans 15. Paul said, we're debtors to them. They, it was the Jewish prophets, the Jewish apostles, the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Old Testament, the writings, the covenants, the promises. The Jewish uh, believers through the years were stewards of that so that 2,000 years ago, the Gentiles come and say, hey, thanks. Thank you for uh, you know, several thousand years before that carrying this. And so Paul said, hey, Gentiles, you are debtors to them. They've done it for 2,000 years, from Abraham to Christ was 2,000 years. And so, he, and then Paul used another word. He says, you have a duty. Yes, the word duty is in there. To sow financially to the Jewish brothers and sisters. You have a duty to, uh, to do that. So we take that seriously. Yeah. Uh, just to get, uh, give a little update as to uh, what's going on. Okay, Dean, bye. Are you gonna do that thing? No, 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 no. But you got, you, you got to get the, the next verse after it. It says, therefore, which now he's going to summarize. He's going to what say, verse? This is verse 28 of Romans 15. Thank you, verse 15. Thank you very much for the prompting. I appreciate your help. Therefore, when I have performed this and I have sealed to them this fruit, this material blessing, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Do you, do you get that? So, so that means if, if Wait, it was on it, the screen before, but say it, left. it Say it normal, I'm not following you. Okay. okay. We're both a little bit brain dead. We, we are. We're both tired, but we're happy. Okay. But pretend like I don't know what you're talking about okay. and say it again. If you believe that as a result of the Jews, you got I do. spiritual blessings, I do. then you're a debtor and you owe them a material blessing. Right. 
And that's what the first guy said. Yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. And then when he takes that that blessing, and I'm gonna go, I know you wanna see me, but I can't come to you. I'm gonna go to Jerusalem first before I come to this you. This is Paul talking. Yeah, and, okay. and I'm gonna drop that blessing there. The financial blessing. Yeah, and the material one, the financial. And then, when I do that, and I'm gonna come to you, I'm coming in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. Oh, that's Are cool. you getting it? I do now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I do get it now. I, I love it when he talks normal, you know what I mean? No comment. <laughs> We've been having a ball for the whole month. <laughs> Dean, I love you. But uh, just a little review of what's happening. Again, tomorrow, 100 million, Friday and Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, an hour at a time, all across the globe, 5,000 prayer ministries are committing to this. Now, many of them don't have a particular heart for Israel or Jerusalem in a particular way. They love Jesus and they love the Great Commission. So they, this 100 million did it in January, focused on Asia, on China, on Beijing and the gospel in China. In, in uh, April 17th, they did it to Mecca in the Middle East. So they're doing it tomorrow, uh, Saturday and Sunday for Jerusalem, and then in October, they're doing it for India. So they're not particularly focused on the biblical narrative of Israel, but they said, I love Jesus and the Great Commission, so we're doing it. But we've been praying 21 days, millions around the earth saying, Lord, when those 100 million lovers of Jesus and the Great Commission pray for Israel, ambush them and touch their heart with more than the Great Commission, although that's really important, but the biblical narrative about Israel that's in the Bible. And so I think tomorrow is a huge day. And I'm, I'm just believing, trusting the Lord that 10, 20, 30% of them are going to connect the dots and go, you know, I've never prayed for Israel before. And, uh, and in the next few months, they're gonna connect the dots and go, wait, it's in the Bible. I'm gonna start doing this more. Could you imagine the global body of Christ gaining 20, 30 million more intercessors for Israel. That would be, that could really happen tomorrow. Now, just a little update on what's going on. So most of you know, five million Gentiles, well over five million. We just don't wanna keep going on the number, but it's beyond that, committed to pray for one hour a day for 21 days for Israel. Over five million Gentiles did that. Number two, we have the Isaiah 62 website. Most of you know about that. That website is mostly a directory of ministries that said, I'm, I'm committed to this. And so we asked ministries, we didn't want individuals to put their name on it, but ministries, if they're committed to pray for Israel. And I mean, I'm just absolutely uh, uh, blown away. 10,000 ministries have put their name on that website all over the world, 10,000 ministries. And so when, through the month of May, it was to help mobilize intercessors in their area. For the 21 days, it was mobilizing the people in their language and in their region. But after May 28th, it's a prophetic declaration to Israel. When they hear the story in six months or a year or two years, hey, did you hear five million Gentiles prayed for Israel in May 2023? Many of them will go like, what? I don't buy that. They're going to click on that website. We're going to keep it up there. We're not going to use it for any other reason, but as a prophetic statement. They're going to turn on it, and when you turn on it, the first thing you see is the information has been translated in 100 languages. So when they turn to Isaiah 62, they're going to go, what is this? 100 languages, the information of the fast and the 21 days is true. Okay. Then they go down to the hubs, and we call it a hub, because it's ministry that want to be a hub of activity in their area, in their language. And they're going to find 10,000 Gentile ministries. And then they're going to find it in 120 different nations. Something, I mean, this is, this is historic. 120 nations, 5 million Gentiles, and 100 languages engaged in this in the month of May. And this, I think they're going to look at this and go like, I don't even know what to do with this. We've had a lot of, uh, not a lot, I mean a little bit is what I meant to say, interaction with uh, 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 Jewish uh, people who don't b believe in Jesus, they don't believe in the gospel, and they found out about this, and they thought like, are you kidding? 
not really. I mean, surely five million didn't really do this. And they looked at that website. We've got a handful of responses from them and they're overwhelmed. One guy who, who a, a, a team went through Jerusalem with a cell phone and they were telling people on the street, did you know five million Gentiles? I saw a couple of those. And these Jewish people were going like, are you kidding? Why? Is this real? Yeah, I'll go check it out. Where? And so I'm thinking this website in the next 10 years is going to be a, a really important statement for uh, what the Lord is doing. So May is historic in, the, in a number of ways. Number one, 40 years ago. Most of you know we had the 21-day fast 40 years ago in May 83. And in that fast, Bob Jones prophesied that we would, there, the day would come, we would have 100 million intercessors. He said, you'll be on the Truman property. You'll have unplugged TV sets all over Asia, meaning smartphones. Of course, who heard of smartphones in 1983? He goes, I'll be watching singers and musicians on the Truman property on unplugged TV sets, which is smartphones in the web stream. We understand that today. And it says, and where it's going is 100 million intercessors are going to be mobilized. And for the first time in history, tomorrow, 100 million. Again, they're not fully committed to, to Israel, but 100 million. It's a down payment. It's the final day of that 21-day fast 40 years ago. It was May 28th. And May 28th is the first time in history. It's a down payment only because they're not fully in yet, but still, this is remarkable. We get to see it with our eyes, the 100 million interceding for Israel. Now, one thing Stewart said that I really appreciated, he said it a couple a month or two ago, he said, what's gonna happen in May 2023 is God's gonna reveal IHOP to IHOP. And I thought that was a profound statement. I went, wow, because one of our major assignments is praying for Israel. and. As a community, there's a big yes in our spirit, but there's not a big uh, understanding as to why. Most of our people, I think, go, yes, it's right. And if you said, why, where's the verses? They go, you know, you know those verses. <laughs> and, and what has happened in the last six or eight weeks, whatever the number is, I've lost track, but we have taken the Fridays and Sundays Isaac, you've given a couple brilliant words, Dave Slyker, Stewart, and there's about eight or ten, whatever the number, six, eight weeks of teaching on Israel that's been given on Fridays and Sundays. It's all on the website. Beloved, you, it's not enough for this community to say, yes, I'm in. Well, why? You know. No, tell me why, because we want you to be one of the messengers telling others. You know that Isaiah 62, what's Isaiah 62? Well, you know the verse we used. What's it say? Well, you know. <laughs> My point being, I'm not putting that down. I'm saying this is a season. I'm talking about not just this week or next month, this next year. Let's learn it. There's 10 or 15 really good messages on the website. Let's get it to where we can give three to four minutes to somebody with it in our heart, not just we believe it and we're in, but we actually are messengers and we're learning it because again, we've been in, I mean, this community is yes, yes, yes. But I mean, you guys, because I haven't done any of those messages, but I've been listening to them and they're, uh, I mean, line by line understanding. But I think just because we're going fast and we're a little tired, it goes over your head, meaning a lot of information, but it's all there. Let's take the next three to six months Let's go and review those, and let's, let's get five or six of those verses into our mouth so that when someone asks us, we can actually give a few reasons. Now, one of the big things, I, you know, I, I've mentioned this a couple of times, I've done well over 50 Zoom calls with uh, uh, all kinds of national and international networks of ministries, you know, I'm just Zoom call. I came up with a new term, Isaac, I invented it. I was Zoom drunk because I had so many Zoom calls. I don't want to do a Zoom call again, but I like it. Every time I get on it, I get excited. And, but my point is this. I'm talking to all these different, many different languages, translators, and it's the same statements over and over. People go, we're in, but we don't know why. And I'm talking about many, many leaders in the body of Christ who love the Bible and they're good Bible teachers, but they don't get the Israel thing, but they're in. 
And when I say this statement to them over and over and over, I mean, not to the same people, but all these different Zoom calls, I said, the gospel makes it clear that the favor of God on Jerusalem is directly related to the increase of the spirit of revival in the Gentile nations. And all these Zoom calls, most many of them go, really? That's in the Bible? Yes, that's in the Bible. Wow. You're telling me that if we pray for Israel and more happens, more happens in the spirit of revival in our nation, and that's biblical. Yes. Most of the Gentile church in the earth does not, cannot connect the dots on that. And I'm not saying, bah humbug, aren't we all dumb? That's not the point. I'm saying God used May 2023 to arrest the tension in the body of Christ. Five million are saying, okay, 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 we want to get this. If it really means more power of the gospel is going to be released in Asia if this happens, where's that in the Bible? I, I want to connect the dots. And Stuart's going to give a little of that tonight. But these six or eight messages that these guys have given and some others as well, they break this stuff down. They really do. And, then, and it's time, okay, it's time to get it. The Lord, you know, really put an exclamation point. He said, IHOP. I want IHOP to understand IHOP. Now, our only mandate is not that. We have a mandate that's, not, that's bigger than Israel. It's the, it's the billion soul harvest and the Great Commission and, and all that. But, int, but Israel is intricate to it. You know, over the years, and I've said this to, over the Zoom calls, that over the years, the 24 years of IHOP, we've had near, not exactly, just short of 25,000 people have been with us in a full-time way. So almost 25,000 staff, students, interns. And uh, many of them have been here two, three years, that kind of, some of them three months, six months, near 25,000. And in the 24 years, well, here's my point of saying that. In the 24 years, the most common statement we have heard from these 25,000, not everybody, my church didn't do Israel. I heard that, we've heard that so many times. And again, that's not, in that terrible? No, no, the Lord says, just wait, I'm going to breathe on this. In May 2023, he's breathing on the conversation. And, and, and here's what I have found. Of these 90% of these 25,000, that's not an exact number. I just kind of made up the 90%. That sounds about right, though, doesn't it? I mean, it was really the vast majority. Here's the good news. And I've told all these networks this. I go, pastors, I got good news for you. In one hour, you can share verses and people will change their mind in one hour. You give them 20 verses, there's about 100 to pick from. Any 20 will make the, the person who loves Jesus in the Bible, most, I mean, there's exceptions, they'll go like, oh, I didn't know that. Because most of the church doesn't, uh, I mean, it's not true that we don't do Israel because they're against Israel. They don't do Israel because their pastors never brought it up. So they just are... We never heard about it. No one's against it. We just never heard about it. It's just been a silence. But the good news is there are literally of 100 verses, passages you could pick from. You pick any 20 of them, a person that loves the Lord in the Bible, they go, wait. Oh, my goodness. It's there. So these 5 million, they're doing that right now. Now, here's the good news. These 5 million, all of them have at least two friends. That means by- Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway. Uh, that means by the end of May, which is now, there's 10 million more believers saying to the 5 million, who each have two friends, why did you do this? Well, you know, it's in the Bible. And the 10 million go, where? My church didn't do Israel. We don't do Israel. Why, why did, are you saying I need to do it? Prove it to me why I need to do it. And the five million go, uh, give me a minute. Give me, I'll get back to you. But here's the point. There's 15 million people that are in the conversation now. And the majority never talked about Israel this first time in their life. From the biblical point of view. 15 million. I mean, now a million or two were already in it. But can you imagine what 15 million believers, which the majority have never checked it out, and it's so easy to convince somebody, if you give them about 20 verses, it takes about an hour, and they look and go, oh my goodness, well, I love Jesus, I love the Bible, I, I ought to start praying for Israel then, because there's a direct relationship about praying for Israel and the gospel going forth in the nations in power. And they go, they may not catch that right away, but they'll see it's biblical. 
Now, I got to give one more number. Fast forward three years. Those 15 million, they all have two or three friends, we hope. Anyway, 50 million believers are going to be in this conversation in about three years. Not convinced, but going, where in the Bible? Wait, what's all this stuff? Everybody's talking, what, where? And I tell you, that's how I was 40 years ago. And that's this 21 day fast we did. And Bob Jones said, a hundred million intercessors. Number one, there was no internet. There wasn't a hundred million that watched the Super Bowl. I said, that's not possible. There's not a hundred million of anything because there's not a structure of technology for that to even happen. And of course, we didn't know the internet would happen. And, and, and so in May 83, I wasn't praying for Israel. I thought the church was Israel. That's what I was taught. And I told Bob Jones, I thought the church was Israel. He goes, oh my, this is gonna be a lot of work. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, that's what I mean, right there. <laughs> what? And even on his videos, Bob never hesitates to say, they didn't believe a word I said. And he meant me. <laughs> We talked about this many times, but it was in the summer of 83, after the fast, I began to look at verses some leaders showed me. I went, wow, wait, whoa, wait a second. I'd been a pastor seven years, and everyone said the church was Israel. I went, when did that verse get in the Bible? You know, what? And it's an easy switch if you look at those verses. But if you never look at them, you don't know. But if you never ask the question, you never look at them. In three years, I'm just guessing. 50 million Gentile believers are gonna be in this conversation. And I mean, it's gonna change the trajectory of planet Earth. Because when we say to Jesus, the city of the great king, he called that Jerusalem. That's my city, Jesus said. It's the city of the great king. In heaven, it's called the new Jerusalem, not the new London, not the new Berlin, not, not the, the new, any, name whatever city you want. Belton. It's, no, it's not the new Belton. Thank you, I appreciate that. I tried. <laughs> it's the new Jerusalem. And there's only one city in the Bible where God says, I am zealous for Jerusalem. And we're saying in Isaiah 62, we've known it a little bit, but I still think a bunch of folks, we've learned Isaiah 62, the name, but we haven't actually looked at the passage much. But there's a whole lot of conversation going around Isaiah 62. At verse one, the Lord says, I'm never going to be quiet about Jerusalem. That's a subject he'll never stop talking about, never. Verse one, he goes, I'll never be silent. Well, why is the church silent then? Then in verse six, he goes, and not only that, in the generation the Lord returns, I'm gonna make a many of my people, they will never be silent because I'm gonna let them connect with my heart. So I'm not silent, verse one, they won't be silent in verse six. And, and the reason you know that's in the generation the Lord returns, because he said, this group that I ignite They'll never be silent until the Lord returns, meaning they're born in the generation of the coming of the Lord. That's why they're never silent, because they're still alive when the Lord returns. Now, the passage is they'll never be silent until Jerusalem's a praise in the earth. But in Old Testament code, that means the second coming of Christ. So there's a generation that God, Isaiah prophesied 2,700 years ago. There's a people, there's a time frame when God won't be silent, verse one, he won't let his people be silent, verse six, until Jesus returns in the sky. Beloved, I believe we're in that generation. This five million that's turning to 15 in the discussion, the 15 that will be 50, God is causing the church never to be silent about the city he really is zealous for. And a lot of believers go, I don't get it, I don't get it. But if Jesus is zealous, I'm going to take some time to get it. Amen, let's stand, or something like that. You sound like you've done this a couple of times. Yeah, on those Zoom calls. That was automatic pilot, but I'm really committed to it. Thank one you. last thing. <laughs> one la this, is tr this is one of my last, last things, one of them. Yeah, go ahead. Get comfortable, Isaac. No, here's the last thing. We are going to miss, this thing's going to be over on Sunday. We're going to miss it. I mean, we felt we got something together that we got used to. And our bodies are tired, so we got this, this conflict. Like, I'm really glad it's over Sunday. Oh, no, it's over Sunday. I'm really glad it's over Sunday. Wait, it's over Sunday. It's weird, isn't it? We're, uh, no, we're sad. But 
we're glad too. Now, I've had a few people saying, are you gonna do this every year till the Lord returns? I go, I found myself, I don't know how it happened. I go, no, <laughs> but I miss it so often. You don't think we will? No, it's been beautiful. It's okay. been amazing being together as a community. And okay. I have loved the packed out night watch section, the evening, the evenings, all the families that have been coming in in the mornings with all their kids, their kids praying on the microphone. I mean, it's unbelievable what has happened in our midst. It has been so beautiful. On that note, Lenny, summer camps. On light of this amazing hour, we get to give this to our children, our grandchildren, those that are watching on, online. Uh, we have probably close to 1,000 plus children, teens coming here in, in just about a week. Uh, throughout July. So what I want to highlight is announcement 13. Uh, we have all 50 states represented coming to our camps. We have about 12 countries right now that are pointed this way, bringing their children. And what I want to do is enlist our spiritual family, our visitors, uh, of course, that are here tonight. I want to enlist us into interceding for at least two children and two teens. So I want you to take on with me on your own, in your own time of prayer, devotions, whatever it is, to pray for two teens and two children. Because uh, we believe that on the back end of this fast, it's not an accident that we would be able to see our camps start one week from the fast. So next Sunday, we will have our first of nine camps. And so take a look at number 13. We're still in need of some folks. We need some prep cooks. Uh, this would be your time to audition. If you want to go on to Gordon Ramsay uh, cooking show, uh, you could get some practice. Uh, we need dishwashers and group leaders. So we've had an increase in our numbers. To our spiritual family, please take advantage of the discounts that are there. We have it online to where you can pay throughout this year. We're going to keep the, the website open so that you can make some payments or whatever and contribute to the camp. And I just want to thank you as a spiritual family, but do adopt two children, two teens. Take a look at number 13. It has all the information there. Pass the word that we need some help in this uh, particular camp. Thank Thanks, you, buddy. lady. Dave Slyker, go ahead and come out. Our School of the Messengers intensive is in motion. It is. So our School of Messengers, we're, we love the crew that comes every month. Was that a battle cry? <laughs> we love the crew that comes every month. It's a, it's a core of folks that come from all over. That uh, what, what we call the 150 chapters that talk about the return of Jesus, the end times, Israel. They want to go deeper in the foreigner themes and messaging. They're doing it with Stuart and myself and Mike and others. For the last two months, we've had Joel Richardson with us. We've been talking about Israel. Next month, if you're interested in jumping in with us, we're going to be talking about the age to come. Just seems natural. Talk about Israel for two months. We're going to talk about the millennial kingdom, the age to come. What happens after the Lord returns? I'm really excited about it. Well, we've got, uh, I need a quick favor. I need altar space. So I just need to temporarily, for those of you that are hanging, just temporarily, I need to move you for a second because we want to, in a moment, I'm giving you about five minute, two minute notice, call it two, but maybe five. Um, we're going to have some folks up here and pray for them. We do it every month. Um, so just give me a little notice. Then you can come back as soon as we're done. We've got a couple testimonies. John and, oh, hey, come on. You're already here. Look at you. John from Houston. Hello, John. Come on. Yes, Christine from Hawaii. So here's what everyone does. When they give testimonies, they usually stand as far away from me as possible. Don't do that. <laughs> Come on, there you go. Okay, so tell us, how has this module been for you? It's really eye-opening. Um, my family, we moved to Kansas City from 2008 to 2012, so we've known the heart of Kansas City and the mission to pray for um, the end times uh, theology and also for Israel. But, um, and then we moved back to, I'm from Hawaii, we moved back to Hawaii in 2012 and we've just kind of been carrying this message. And I knew things, I was kind of like how Mike was explaining, like, we pray for Israel, well why? I was like, oh, 
I don't know. <laughs> and since then, I've gathered a little bit more on the scriptures on why, but the school of messengers just is opening my eyes to how much I don't know and the heart um, of even praying for Messianic Jews and the persecution that they're facing. And I just, I didn't understand that. I didn't know that. Um, or even how to talk to a Jewish person, how to partner and pray for, for Jewish believers. And it's just, it really touched my heart in a very deep way and things that I didn't understand. And so now I have more understanding than just more than even here are the Bible verses. Now I can maybe even enter, feel boldness maybe to enter into a conversation. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I love that. Come on. Come on. And then I would say the hallmark of the School of Messengers is the training and equipping of a people of understanding. Um, I know many of us know Daniel 11, 32, and 33, but there will be a people Let's who... Let's pretend none of us do. Yeah, there will be a people who know their God, who will stand firm. One translation says that they will valiantly resist the flattery and betrayal of the end of the age. And these people who are filled with wisdom, they will help give understanding to many of what is happening. And that's happening in the School of Messengers. I feel like we are being equipped with a message. I, I had a picture of myself before the School of Messengers with this bugle in my mouth, and I was trying to blow, and there was no sound coming out. And the Lord this week has shown me that same picture, and there is a clarity of sound that is coming out. And so the framework that we're learning of the, the gospel of the kingdom, the mystery of Israel, the, the role of the Gentile bride, it's, it's profound. And so I just want to honor you. Stuart's been a mentor, long distance father to, to me and so many others. And we're just so thankful for this house and this community. You're marking cities and nations all over the world. And so we're so thankful for you guys. Beautiful. Wait, don't go anywhere. Neither of you. Well, here's what we do. We do this every month. So at School of the Messengers, if you could come line up across the front. Come quickly. Woo! Come quickly. Line up all the way down to the end. You can stand on the lines. There's two, two lines there to stand on. Face that way. And of course, you know online, we want to pray with you as well. We have a number that, are, that join us online every month. Some do both. Some come and some join us online alternating months or whatever. Go, feel free to spread out. Even do two lines if you want. It makes it easy for people to get to you. And then I'd love to invite, as they're coming, our staff. Our staff. If you, staff, family, folks that want to come and pray for them, if you could come and begin to move through and lay hands and pray for them. Yes. Now, as our, as our staff, our team, our family's coming, I want to have you guys, while they're praying for them, I want to have you guys pray for a different group in the room. You're in the room, and you're provoked by this group. You're going, and what Mike said, you're going, wait a minute, I need help. I, I'm in, but I need help. I want what you said was so good. I, I feel confident now. I, had a, I have a confidence. I have a clarity, you said, and confidence, you said. What they're, what they're saying, that clarity on the messaging, the confidence to talk about it with others. You're going, I'm in, I want that. I'd like to ask the Lord for that. If that's you, wherever you're at, I want to invite you to stand. I want them to pray for you. You're going, I, I want more of that. I want more confidence. I want more clarity. Go ahead and stand all over the room. As they minister up here, we just take a minute. Let's pray for the different ones that are standing, even ones that are watching online going, me, you can, as they're praying, just say, yes, Lord, I'm in. Yeah, so Father, we honor this house, we honor this community, Lord, and I thank you for those who have stood, those who are watching online. Father, we ask that you would break off all familiarity of what we think we understand. God, we ask for new paradigms, new frameworks of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. God, would you break all pride? I just, I feel like those of you who have been through IHOPU, you've been through training, you, you have so much understanding, but I feel the Lord's invitation, would you come and turn aside for more? Would you come and turn aside for greater understanding of what is to come? And so, Father, would you release grace? Would your leadership by the Spirit draw many to the well to drink of the wisdom and revelation that's laid up by the Spirit? In Jesus' name. Yes, 
Father God, we just thank you so much. And we say, there's, you say in your word that you have not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of boldness. And, and when we don't have the words, Father God, you place them in our mouth. Holy Spirit, you minister and you deposit things into us that we don't even know are there. And, but when you come at, call it to come alive, it comes alive. And so, Father God, I pray and impart boldness all across this room, all across to those watching online, Father God. We pray boldness on your tongue, boldness in your spirit, man. Come alive in the name of Jesus. We release the spirit of boldness, Father, to speak your word, to speak your truth, and to speak your goodness. May you be glorified forever and ever. Amen. If somebody's standing by you and you want to take a second and turn and pray for them, just lay a hand on them. We're asking for clarity and confidence, clarity to understand and confidence to be able to talk to others about this message. The Lord's heart for the end of the age, for Israel, the return of his son. We want to grow in these things. Help us, Lord. Bruce and Becky Jackman, I just have this picture of this golden scroll behind you with writing on it. And I, I feel that it's this sign of preparation that the Lord has been preparing you with this message and that the Lord is gonna release you into that message and that the Lord has called you to be sons of Issachar that have, time, that have understanding of the times and the seasons. And I just see it so clearly over you. So Father, I ask you, for Bruce and Becky, their whole family. Lord, for Chris and Sarah, their grandchildren. Lord, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to touch them, to mark them, to strengthen them, to anoint their lips, Lord, for such a time as this, that you would bring forth a sound from them, a sound and a tone that's bathed in the beauty of God, the love of God, the gentleness of the Spirit of God. I just see this gentleness marking your words. Lord, release it upon them. Strengthen them. Touch their minds. Lord, give Becky dreams. Lord, touch her mind, Lord. Release the prophetic anointing to dream and to hear in the night watches in the name of Jesus upon her. somebody back here on the bleachers and you've been asking the Lord for a prophetic dream you either haven't had one or or haven't had one for a long time a prophetic dream just someone back here if that's you I just want to pray for you just wave your hand if you've been asking the Lord specifically for prophetic dreams or you've never had a prophetic dream okay there's three or four or five of you six of you maybe it's all of you I don't know but Father, I just, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, you said that you'd pour your spirit out on the sons and the daughters, young and old. You would release dreams and visions. You would speak in the night season. Paul talks about the Lord redeeming the time for the days are evil. And prophetic dreams is one of the days that he, one of the ways that the Lord redeems time because a third of our life is spent sleeping. We want it to be more than that, but it's not. But Father, I just ask that you would touch these individuals that are asking for the increase of the prophetic upon their life. Lord, release your anointing upon them. Touch their minds and their hearts. Lord, stand watch over them. Just disruptive things at night that are assaulting them, whether it's anxiety or just the circumstances of life. I ask for the peace of God to surround them as they sleep. Lord, anoint them for dreams in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, School of Messengers. We're so glad you're here with us. All right, as they're just headed back to their seats, many of you know that we're in session with our Gideon 300. These are folks that have come from across the world to join us and jump in on the night watch. This is Kirk Bennett. This is Kirk Bennett, my younger brother. No, but he's been, he's been leading us and, and leading the charge on this Gideon 300. And so we got a couple of testimonies. Yeah, just tell yeah. us what's been going on. Well, Gideon 300, how you guys doing? Come on. I just want to ask real quick, all of the Gideon 300, whether you're a coach, an RA, or a student, just stand up right now and raise your hand. Come on. Come on. We are so glad that you all are here with us. What a joy. This has been amazing. And go ahead and sit back down. We're not done yet. This is not a celebration. Right? We're going to give testimonies, but we're going back in. And I just want to say before I start, if you've come in for the weekend or to complete the fast with us, just raise your hand right now in the room. If you've come in and you're gone, I came here to just join come in in the end of this. Straight arms up. Let's see those hands. All right. Welcome. We are so glad that you're here with us. This is so fun. Now, some of you have taken road trips and that kind of thing is crazy. You're doing the crazy thing. I want to amp it up one more. Come in with us into the night watch tonight. Just come in and pull an all-nighter. Pull an all-nighter with us. You won't regret it. Something amazing is happening in the night. And we just want to invite you in. There's plenty of chairs. Well, mostly plenty of chairs because they're all up dancing half the time. So, so there's plenty of chairs. Get in there and get about it. One amazing thing that's happened this week is uh, yesterday. What was yesterday? I don't even know. Uh, yesterday, yeah. Yeah, 1 a.m. It was actually 9 a.m. In, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, which was when the Spirit was poured out, 9 a.m. on the day of Pentecost. And, and, and so we, something just broke out in the room. We started crying out. For Israel, we got uh, a message from some people who are in Israel going, keep going, keep shouting, we're believing with you. It was uh, really amazing to be able to do that on the day of Pentecost. So uh, this is uh, Hadassah and Martel, okay? And you guys hold your microphones right here. I'm just gonna do a quick interview with you, okay? Just tell Martel something that happened to you during the time here. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been incredible. The Lord, he equipped me with a heart for Israel. Um, I came here in contention for it, but I had no idea what that actually meant. I just was hungry and zealous. Um, and as I encountered him, I encountered my dullness, uh, my prayerlessness, and my offensive heart. I was offended that he loved Israel. I was offended that it wasn't about me. Um, I just had a selfish spirit in my heart, and he came and broke that. He broke me to my feet. He broke my heart. Um, and now I love it. I'm all for him and all for his desires, for his people, his heritage, and all that he's going to do with them. It's good. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. What happened? <laughs> So basically, since being here, my perspective on almost everything has shifted. My perspective on God, my perspective on the Bible, my perspective on life, my perspective on us as Gentiles and our position in the world. And he's really just shown me like how important Israel is to him. And in that, then I go reading the Bible looking for, oh, what is this about Israel? And then, yeah, we're grafted into that. But this is really about Israel. And it just shifts like my whole purpose because now our purpose as Gentiles is to call out Israel, like call them out of their slumber, wake them up. So it's really been a huge perspective shift for me. Good, good. All right. Martel, tell one thing that happened to you in the room and one thing that happened outside of the room that, that marked you. Yeah. Um, the Lord gave me a couple of prophetic words. Um, it was crazy. It happened each night. So throughout this last week, he gave me five prophetic words for five different witnesses who did not know each other. Um, it began with him 
telling me that I was marked and that he had a purpose over my life. And as the words kept coming, it went uh, from what he was going to do uh, until that he actually enjoyed me and that he delighted in me, which pulled me further into Israel, further into his heart, his purposes, and ultimately his plan uh, for the end times. It was really good. Yeah. And as far as um, what happened back at base, I have to say the fellowship in the body, uh, edifying. This is my first time ever being in a full body of Christ. I've just gone through two years, a desert of a season, and just isolation and dependence with Jesus. And so I was brought and pulled into the body uh, just to be vulnerable, to be sloppy, um, just to be encouraged by my brothers. It's been an experience unlike anything I've ever had before, and I just lift him up with the highest praise because of it. <laughs> Hadassah, one thing in the room, one thing outside yeah. of the room that happened to you. So inside the room, one of the nights this past week during the two to four set, um, I was actually reading John 6, where just God talks about like putting up your treasures in heaven. And then I, it was probably something they were singing or something, but then like the Lord just started to reveal himself to me as like the bridegroom and that he really is the perfect husband and Israel is his bride. And even though like I started writing down a bunch of the characteristics of God and it's like, even though Israel and we are unfaithful, like God's always faithful. Like even though we don't always love him, he always loves us. Even though we're not always pursuing him, he's always pursuing us. So he just really started to like reveal that to me during that whole set and that whole night. And that was really powerful. And then as far as outside of the room, um, one of the things that was really cool that happened, and this is different than what I told you earlier, but I remembered it now. Uh -oh. But <laughs> I had a dream where I went home and nobody remembered me. And it was really funny because that really bothered me. But then later we were talking with our small group and it hit me. That's how God feels about Israel. Like they're his people. He loves them and he comes and then they don't remember him. And like that hit me and that marked me so deeply. Wow. Yeah. Okay. One more thing, just mm -hmm. real short. Live in the lifestyle of the night watch. And, and we doubled down with, with our group, with the Gideon 300s. We said, we're not even going to leave the room except to use the restroom. No outside. We're going to stay in the room for six hours straight. And you guys have done that. What's it like to live in this lifestyle of the night watch? The cold, hard, authentic truth is that stuff is hard, man. That stuff is hard. <laughs> it's good, but it's hard. Um, you encounter your spiritual dullness, you encounter your prayerlessness, you encounter your offense, your jealousy, all those harbored emotions that you have, uh, whether they be to God, whether they be to his plan, his purposes, whatever the case may be, but he brings them up and exploits them, he exposes it. Um, and he just plants his hand, he touches your heart with the affections of his heart and just the plans of his hope. Uh, it's just really good. It's That's really awesome. good. Yeah. That's awesome. Good. That's awesome. Yeah, it was definitely hard at first, but then after it was actually really cool to get to be part of that night watch. And um, I had somebody actually say this to me a couple of days ago, but like the moon, it pulls the tides and like the moon rules over the night. But then at, during the day, it's still pulling the tides. So like what we do in the night has impact on the day. And it's really cool just to like be part of that night watch and know that as we're going to sleep during the day, what we were doing, praying and interceding all night is having an impact during the day. So yeah. And we call it a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice in the world's eyes, mm -hmm. but there's an empowerment it, that, that, that all of our people, they, they're sleeping. They're sleeping eight hours. They're, they're, they're eating and, and, and this kind of thing. And their, their bodies have been graced to do this. And so I wanna encourage you, ask God for grace to do this, to enter into this and, and try it out for two nights. Try it out for the next two nights. Why not? You know, just hop in. We believe the Lord wants to pack this night watch. And then uh, on, on Sunday, a bunch of us are going to get up and still come to church when we should be going to bed. So anyhow, go, go Gideon 300. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have our ushers. Our ushers get ready to receive the evening offering. The information on how to give will be up on your screens. Father, we love you. Lord, we rejoice in your work, all that, is, 
all that is happening like that, we ask you, Lord, for the anointing of your spirit to increase in our midst. We ask that you would touch our hearts. Lord, that you would touch the next generation, that there would be an acceleration of your heart and your purposes for Israel that would just continue to increase in the days and months and years ahead. We bless you, Lord. We rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen. to the inner courts so I can be there with you but take me to the deeper places I can be made more like you. Oh, would you place your seal upon my heart, your seal upon my arm, your seal of fiery love? Would you place your seal upon my heart, your seal upon my arm, your seal of fiery love?
fiery love Would you place your seal upon my heart Your seal upon my arm Your seal of fiery love Come and burn Come and burn Come and burn Deep within, Lord Come and burn Come and burn Come and burn With the fires of your love Oh, oh, oh. We're groaning, we're longing, we're aching, we're groaning, we're longing, we're aching, we're groaning for your return, for your return. We're longing, we're aching, we're groaning, we're longing, we're aching, we're groaning, we're longing. We're aching, we're groaning for your return, for your return. Would you place your seal upon my heart, your seal upon my arm, your seal of fiery love? Would you place your seal upon my heart, your seal upon my arm, your seal of fiery love? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Good evening. Um, there are notes available if you'd like to have them. If you don't have them, just go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to have the notes. And uh, the ushers will get them to you. And go ahead and turn your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we ask you that you would cause the entrance of your word, Father, to bring light to our hearts. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would cause the morning star, your son, to rise, Father, within our hearts, in our spirit. And give us understanding, Father, that your spirit would take the things that are precious to you and your son concerning Jerusalem and make them known to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, during the announcement, uh, Mike uh, made a statement that just got me thinking. He was talking about how, you know, we're, we're going to miss what happened in these last uh, uh, 21 days because we've actually gone somewhere together as a spiritual family. And, uh, and I thought that's, that's, that's so, so true. And I think there's many reasons for that that we don't wanna necessarily get into, but as he said that, I got to thinking about uh, the reset. It was back in 2018 and the Lord just put it on the heart of our leadership team to, uh, to have a reset and to, uh, uh, and to cancel one thing and all of our national conferences and so forth. And when Mike made that statement, I just kind of went, it's kind of just this flash through my mind. I went, wow, I go, Lord, you have, you've really have helped us um, in response to this reset. And you have, um, you've really given us a gift because one of the things that we, had in our hearts when we said yes to the Lord to doing this reset was one would that he would uh, uh, give us an increased grace uh, for intimacy with the Lord. And one of the things that shows up is the whole message of John 13 to 17, um, that he would give us grace in terms of the, uh, the grace of the Anna calling and just seeing the Lord strengthening our spiritual community um, in terms of the, the intercessory missionary assignment 
uh, that he would uh, give us uh, insight into the Forerunner ministry, and here we are. Um, you know, there's so much about the Forerunner message that doesn't make sense um, outside of the context of, 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 of Israel. And the fourth one was that we would grow as a family, and, uh, and that was the thing that triggered me when Mike said, you know, we are going to miss this. We've gone somewhere together. And I just found myself just, uh, just so grateful to the Lord uh, in terms of his response to us um, um, because of the reset. And the truth of the matter is that we had done one thing 2023. There is no, uh, what, what is it, 2023? Yeah, 2022, there is no way in the world we could have done what we did uh, uh, this month. But the truth is, there's a lot of things that we could not have done. Uh, we, uh, because the, the, one of the things that the Lord did in 2021, he began to stir our hearts to, uh, to go on that 40-day fast which ended up being really a four days of consecration, but that's a whole different not a subject for another day. But, uh, but one of the things that struck me is that there were three things that um, our team set out to do uh, during that 40-day fast. One was that we would, uh, uh, the Lord would give us insight of how to overcome the Laodicean spirit. Uh, the second thing was the whole issue of Psalm 2, uh, just the, uh, uh, how to stand for truth in the midst of the culture. And the third one was praying for Israel. And, um, and so we were ready to, to do those three things, and we started to engage the, you know, the whole subject of the lay to see in spirit, and the Lord just put pause to that whole thing. And the entire 40 days was the Lord speaking to us about the lay to, lay to see in spirit within our own midst. Well, then the, the next year, we said, okay, let's do the revival thing. Well, then the Lord began hitting the issue of speech, and, and he says, no, there is a messaging calling on this community, and I want to I address the issue of your speech. And then here we are, the third year, he says, now let's talk about Israel. And so we actually end up doing the three things we were going to do three years ago, but it took us three years to get to all three of them. And so just, anyway, so I'm just kind of marveling in my heart um, at the Lord's leadership in terms of how he is leading us in the midst of all of this. And then to think that, you know, uh, Chris Reed gave that word uh, back about 18, almost two years ago, 18 months ago. Um, about the crossing the River Jordan at the 40-year mark. And just to think that uh, 40 years ago, you know, Mike started, you know, the movement back in December 5th, 1982, and uh, the, Lord, um, the Lord actually did two things. He, uh, he shifted his, his, his message to Isaiah 62, as well as the calling forth of the Gideon 300. And so here we are 40 years later, Isaiah 62 fast. Um, and the Lord um, sent 300 people, you know, in the night watch. And, and, uh, and in my mind, you know, these 300 uh, is not just the ones who came. It, it, the, 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 the band of 300 includes the one who have been doing the night watch, you know, full time. And so there was like, you know, 30, 40, 50 of them in the night. And then, you know, 200, you know, 207, 280 joined. And that, to, that, that band together it's what makes up that, that Gideon 300. It's, it is a reality in the spirit. It's more than just a program. And so it's just absolutely amazing just to watch the Lord's uh, leadership, and I'm just uh, uh, grateful to him. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3. But before we go to Zechariah 3, we're going to go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's not in the notes. And, uh, you know, Mike Bigger doesn't get to complete his notes. I get to bring up passages that are not in the notes. <laughs> but uh, first, uh, Timothy. And the reason why I want to start there just for a brief moment is because I want to talk tonight about a prophetic perspective of how to bless Israel. And the reason why I call it prophetic is not because of my perspective. It's because um, Zechariah had a prophetic encounter with the Lord and lots of things are happening in that passage, but, but it comes down to that one of the things that is happening, I believe the Lord is showing Zechariah how it is that we can be, how we can bless Israel, because it says in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you. But the other thing is, is that in um, Zechariah 3, what is happening is we're seeing that the call to intercession is a response by a people who have been visited by grace. I'll say this again, that the call to intercede and to pray for all men, as Paul says in just a few moments in 1 Timothy chapter two, is a response by a people who have been visited by grace. 
And the reason why we're praying for Israel is because we are a people who have been visited by grace. So what is happening in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Paul, he says, I thank God, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And so Paul here is recognizing that it is the operation of the Spirit. God enabled him. It was the operation of the grace of God uh, that put him in the apostolic ministry. But in the verse 13, here's what he says. He says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man or a violent man, Paul here is describing the kind of man that he was before he met Christ. And he says this, he says that I did these things ignorantly in unbelief, and I love this next phrase. He says, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. So Paul is, he has his past in full view in terms of the kind of man that he was before he met the Lord. And he says, you know, God's grace was exceedingly abundant. And he says that with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, and then he makes a statement, he says, this is a faithful saying, that God sent Christ to save sinners, of which I am the chief, Paul says. And he goes on to say that he obtained mercy. And beloved, this is, this is our story tonight. It may not be blasphemous, insolent, and so forth, but all of us have adjectives that describe our lives before we met the Lord. And the day that we met the Lord, his grace was exceedingly abundant towards us. And we obtained mercy, Paul says. He continues in verse 16, he says, however, for this reason I obtained mercy. He says, there's a reason why I obtained mercy. He says that I, that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern for those who are going to be saved. He says, I'm aware of something. He says, I'm aware of my past. He says, I'm aware of my humanity. He says, and I'm aware of the fact that God's grace was exceedingly abundant and I am aware of the long suffering of Christ in my life. And I understand that the patience of Christ towards me and in my life is a pattern, it is, it is a model uh, for others who are going to come to know the Lord. He says they're gonna to come to know the Lord with all kinds of baggage, with all kinds of issues and all kinds of struggles and Paul says, and in my journey, uh, I was encountered by the patience of Christ as I was responding wholeheartedly to, uh, to follow and to obey the Lord. And he says, and my life is a pattern. It is a pattern of that grace. It is a pattern of that mercy. And, uh, and again, beloved, that is our story, that God was exceedingly abundant. He, uh, he came to us uh, wide open with his heart and he extended grace in extended mercy towards us. And Paul is just absolutely beside himself in verse 17. He says, now, and he, 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 he responds uh, in worship. Paul seems to have these moments in his writings where all of a sudden he just stops and he has to magnify the glory and the beauty of God. He says, the king eternal, immortal, invisible to God alone who's wise, to him be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And in light of this, truth of Paul's past and, um, uh, and, and God's exceedingly abundant grace and his mercy and his love and his patience towards Paul, it is in light of that that Paul now gives a charge to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I'm going to give you a charge. He goes, and the charge is this, that you, you stay the course, Timothy, stay the course, fight the good fight. He goes, wage war with the prophetic words that have been spoken over you. And he says, stay the course when it comes to the faith because some have suffered shipwreck. In other words, some have fallen away from the faith. And then he mentions these two men. 
And he says that, that he delivered these men over to Satan. They were handed over to divine discipline. And it says this, that, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now I wanna point something out. When Paul is saying that he handed them over to divine discipline, that they may learn not to blaspheme, you have to remember that Paul just remembered that he once was a blasphemer himself. And that he knows that there's a God who wants to be exceedingly abundant with his grace, even towards these two men. And he says, but I'm handing them over for divine discipline in the hopes that they would encounter the exceedingly abundant grace of God, that they would encounter the patience of Christ, that they too would become a pattern on behalf of others. And then Paul says this in chapter two, verse one, says, how many of you know that when he wrote it, those chapter divisions were not there? So he's continuing his thought. He says, therefore, Timothy, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, and intercessions with thanksgiving be made for all men. That, it's, that prayers and intercessions are made for all as a response by a people who've been visited by grace. And then Paul says, especially those who are in authority, kings and all who are in governmental leadership, that you may lead uh, quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and our reverence. Now, what's happening here is that when he's talking about prayer for kids, the reason why Paul is isolating the governmental leaders, because he starts off by saying, he says, look, because we've been visited by grace, because we remember the kind of people that we were before we met him, and because we've obtained mercy, and because he's extended his long suffering towards us, he goes, it is for that reason that we want to respond in intercession as intercessors, as believers for all men. And then he, and then he puts in a parenthesis, he goes, and for those who are in authority, for kings and leaders. And one of the reasons why he highlights kings and leaders is because the human tendency is not to pray for leaders, it's to pray to them. And Paul is saying, no, he goes, no, you got to pray for them too. Yes, even Nero. Because in verse four and five, he says, he says, here's why, because God desires that all men would be saved. This verse often gets used for the praying for the changing of laws, and I'm all for that. But the thing that's on Paul's mind is the, is the salvation even of Nero in all of his blasphemous ways. And this becomes a very important uh, uh, passage because, and I'm not, this may not be your experience, but this has been mine where, you know, when I've asked people to pray uh, for uh, uh, political leaders, if it is a person that is of the party that they are not necessarily in favor of, it's been quite amazing to me how often there's resistance to that. And I think to myself, you don't realize that you forgot that you've been visited by grace. And so the grace of God is the thing that, we, um, uh, that causes us to respond in the place of intercession. And that is the message, really part of the message of Zechariah chapter three. Let's go ahead and turn there. Because what is happening in Zechariah chapter three is we actually see Israel's condition. And in seeing Israel's condition, or Jerusalem's condition very specifically, the Lord makes three decrees, and we'll look at those decrees in just a few moments, but he makes three very powerful decrees. And I think that these, these are decrees that we want to pray as we pray for Israel. We want, to, we want to say these decrees. We want to say them to the Lord. We want to say them over the Jewish people. The first decree is, I have chosen her. I have chosen her. Decree number two, I will remove her iniquity and give her clean garments. I will remove her iniquity and give her clean garments. And the third one is I will put a turban on her. And, um, and part of that turban is really referring, this is something that Dean Bai pointed out to me, is that this turban really is reflective of the name of God being put on the forehead of the Jewish people. So Roman number one, Blessing Israel by agreeing with the God's election of Abraham. 
We know the passage in uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, the Lord tells Abraham, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So I want to take a few moments and talk about what are some of the practical implications of what it means to bless Israel and what does it mean to curse Israel. Paragraph A, that the blessing of Israel is first and foremost about agreement with God and his leadership in electing Abraham. The first way that we bless Israel is by coming into agreement that God was perfectly right, perfectly free, merciful, just, and righteous when he chose Abraham to be the father of all the nations. Now, this principle of God blessing those who bless them and God cursing those who curse them, that principle did not stop with the birth of the new covenant. There are some that uh, would say that it stopped with the birth of the new covenant and that it was entirely translated over to the church. And, that is not, and that's not accurate. It, it, is, it is a principle that is true throughout history and I would say that it includes the church because the, because the church was drafted into that which Abraham uh, uh, which um, uh, that which Abraham represents. The New Testament tells us that there are three uh, components that uh, uh, that point to us about this seed. Number one, it's Christ Himself, and so I'll bless those who bless you. A curse is a curse that has spoken to Jesus and about Jesus. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. It is spoken about the Jewish people. And it is spoken about the church as well. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 6, I have it right there in the notes, uh, Paul makes a very intense statement on behalf of the church. He says that since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulations those who trouble you. It's a very, very intense statement. Paragraph B. King David, uh, he declared that those who show concern for Jerusalem through love and through intercession, that they would prosper. Now, um, what does it mean to prosper? Uh, prosperity in, a, um, in the most basic sense means this, is to find success and fruitfulness in life. Success and fruitfulness in life. Now, this doesn't mean that you're gonna become a billionaire, that's not what it means. It just means that whatever assignment that is in front of you, uh, whether large or small, whatever sphere that you have, that you be fruitful and that you, and that you be successful in that sphere. So when he says pray for the peace or pray for the shalom over Jerusalem, he says may they prosper, may they find success and be fruitful those who love you. Now, this idea of blessings and curses, well, what does it actually mean? Well, it includes three things. Number one, it includes intentions, words spoken, and actions taken. I'll say this again. The ideas of blessings and curses, it starts out with intentions, and these intentions, they inform words, or they inform actions. Now what, are these, um, now, what are these intentions? Well, to bless something means that we have an intention to be helpful. When we want to bless something, we, are, we have our hearts set to be helpful. We want to bless someone, we're setting hearts to be helpful to that person. Uh, we, want to we want to bless a group, then we are setting hearts to be helpful to that group. The curse is the exact opposite. It is the intention to resist. It is the intention to not be helpful. It is the intention to make their life difficult. It's the intention to not help them succeed and be fruitful in whatever it is that their life is about. And so when we bless, when the Lord says, I will bless those who bless you, what he's saying is, he says, I will be helpful to those who are helpful to you. Or another way to say it is, he says, I will send the helper, the spirit, to those that are being helpful to you. And so when the Lord spoke that to, uh, to, uh, to Abraham, therein, I believe, was the very beginnings even of the promise of the release of the Holy Spirit in the nations of the earth. He says, but I will curse those who curse you. He says, those who are set with the intent to not help, to not cooperate, uh, uh, to, uh, to stand in your way, he, he says, I will stand in their way. 
An example of this, again there in the notes, is Numbers chapter 20, verse 20 to 21. It's a story where Moses and Israel, they were, uh, they were trying to find a passageway through Edom. And, uh, and when they were asking for a passageway, the king of Edom said, nope, he, goes, he says, you will not go through. You shall not pass through. And so Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. And thus Edom refused to give Israel passing. All they needed was a passage through as they were on their way to the promised land. And the king says, nope, you can't go through this. Well, in Isaiah 34, I don't want to get too much into the details of this, uh, we find out that the Lord has a very, very long memory. <laughs> and uh, and that's a serious passage. He says to Edom, he says, Edom, verse 10, he says, he's talking about, fire and brimstone that will, that will appear in the land. And he says, it shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. And here it is, it shall lie waste, he says, and no one shall pass through it. He goes, since you were in the mood of let, not letting me and my people come through, he goes, then nobody's gonna go through. And he brings a resistance there in that region. Paragraph D. So Israel's blessed are cursed by words and by deeds. Now here's what's important. And the reason one of the reasons why uh, breaking down the understanding of blessing and curses is important is because it doesn't mean that we don't have critique of things that are done wrong by the state. Nor do we overlook their blindness to the gospel. We're living in a time more and more where loyalty equals agreement. And if you disagree, then you are disloyal. And as things are heating up within the culture, it is just getting this way more and more and more. And we see this even within the political sphere. One area, this is gonna get me run out of town, but you know, I'm just a little too old to care at this point. Uh, and for those of you who be running after me, I don't run that fast anymore, so yeah, you have an advantage. No, but, we, no, but this happened during, during COVID, right? If you were right-leaning, do not be caught wearing a mask because if you did, you might as well put the mark of the beast on your right hand. If you were, were left-leaning, don't be caught not wearing a mask because you are, now you're like the most insensitive you know, borderline, you know, murder, you know, because you don't care about people. But here's the problem. The problem was that the truth is there were some on the left who really didn't really want to wear the mask, but what they didn't want to do, they didn't want to have a two-hour conversation with their friends, convincing their friends, I really do care about human beings, I just don't want to wear a mask. Now, on the right side, there were some going, you know what, actually, I kind of like the wear a mask, but they didn't want to spend two hours convincing their friends that, hey, I, really, I do still love Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, okay. <laughs> and somehow, you know, the mask became our peace, no longer Christ. Okay. And so... The same thing happens with Israel, if we're not careful. Blessing Israel does not mean that we have to agree with everything that Israel does, number one. Number two, it does mean that we can offer critique, but here's the, but here's the point, but what's the intent? The intent has to be to be helpful. That's what makes it a blessing. Paragraph E. What we see is um, in Zechariah chapter three, but before, actually before we go in paragraph E, what we see in Zechariah three is Zechariah actually sees Joshua's condition. But he doesn't only see Joshua's condition, he sees God's assessment and God's declaration that was triumphing over the declaration of Satan. 
There were two decorations that were taking place in Zechariah chapter 3. There was a decoration of Satan and a decoration of, of the angel of the Lord. And the decoration of the angel of the Lord, that was the decoration that triumphed. And that is a decoration that we want to align ourselves up with as it comes to the nation of Israel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But the evil one, he has postured day and night to oppose and to accuse Israel. Say this again, the evil one, he is postured day and night to oppose and accuse Israel. I believe that Zechariah chapter three, really the whole passage, but for our purposes tonight, Zechariah chapter three, verses one to five, and Revelation chapter 12, verses nine and 10, that they are parallel passages, that they go together and what we see there is that the opposition that Zechariah saw in Zechariah chapter 3, Revelation 12 tells us that the, that the opposition there, it is incessant, day and night, night and day, seeking to oppose Israel. And so the Lord gives Zechariah this vision so that Zechariah would know how to prophesy according to the heart of God for Israel that was not based on her natural condition to prophesy over Jerusalem, not based on her natural condition. And again, the good news is, is that that is how the Lord relates with us. And that's how we ought to relate with one another, that we can prophesy and speak about one another according to God's assessment, according to the conversation of the court of heaven, not according to the voice of the accuser. And what we see here in Zechariah 3 is that Israel's condition is not good. In fact, the, the angel of the Lord tells Satan, he says, is this not a brand plugged from the fire? And when he makes that statement, it is actually pointing back to Amos chapter 4, verse 11. Amos chapter 4, verse 11. I'm not going to get into it, but the short version is, is that in Amos 4, verse 11, God compares Israel to uh, 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 yeah, Jerusalem to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so even in that condition, the Lord says, but that is not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story for the nation of Israel. He said that she will be like a brand that is plucked from the fire. And that fire there is the fire of divine discipline. Israel right now, uh, and many Jewish people today, by and large, they are secular. They are, they, are, uh, they, they are resistors to the gospel, resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In paragraph G, but the Lord in this hour is calling the church to come before the Lord through the word to come into alignment with his heart and vision for Israel and the Jewish people. But again, the thing that actually helps us with that alignment is understanding that you and I have been visited by, his, by, by the exceedingly abundant grace. I'll say this again. We have been visited by his exceedingly abundant grace. And therefore, we can look at Israel's condition and not side with the enemy's narrative, but side with the angel of the Lord and say, no, I have chosen her. I will remove her iniquity. I will give her clean garments. I will put a turban on her head. So we pray and prophesy according to God's counsel. And when we pray according to God's counsel or God's narrative or God's agenda, what happens is we avoid what Paul calls boasting against the branch. I'll say this again. When we pray according to God's counsel, we are avoiding the trap of boasting against the branch. Now, what is this boasting against the branch look like? At its very core, the boasting against the branch is this. They are self-righteous indictments by people who have forgotten that they themselves once were in sin. The boasting against the branches is when we have forgotten that we were visited by the exceedingly abundance of his grace. And secondly, they are self-righteous boasts from people who are still trapped 
in the Romans 3.23 trap that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's go to page two. But God has chosen Jerusalem. But God has chosen Jerusalem. The purpose of and theme of the book of Zechariah is Jerusalem, her future glory and purpose. That is the main theme of the book of Zechariah, is God's purpose, that Jerusalem has a future glory and a purpose. And what is happening from chapters one to chapter six, the prophet Zechariah, he receives eight visions from the Lord in one night related to God's plan and God's purposes for the nation of Israel. And what we see essentially are three things. Number one, we see God's zeal for Jerusalem. We see that God has deep yearnings, deep longings, deep affections, deeply committed to Jerusalem. It says in Zechariah 1 verse 14, he says, I'm zealous for Zion with a great zeal. Number one, number two, what we see in these visions is the restoration of her calling as a worshiping city of the true God. We see the restoration of her calling as a worshiping city, a worshiping people of the, of the God of Israel. And then thirdly, what we see is the restoration of her calling to, to, uh, to steward uh, the glory of God. I like the way that Dave Slyker says it, that they have an assignment to host the presence of God. Now, the presence of God will fill the earth, but the epicenter of God's glory, because the, the fullness of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ himself, will dwell there, and the manifest glory of God will be there, and, and, and Jerusalem will be the city that's appointed by God to host the presence of God. So the message and ministry of Zechariah is designed to do two things, to really, it is to, actually to do one thing, it is to connect our hearts with Jesus' heart for Jerusalem. That is the main message and ministry of Zechariah, is to connect our hearts with Jesus' zeal and Jesus' commitment for Jerusalem. Paragraph B, Jerusalem is a city that is eternally chosen by God where again, the, the Jesus as the fullness of God in bodily form, Colossians chapter two, verse nine, he will live there forever. I mean, that is amazing to think about that. That the man, Christ Jesus, the one whom we love, the resurrected man, he will take residence in Jerusalem. That's pretty amazing. The city is eternally chosen for that purpose. And what's gonna happen there is Jesus is going to, from that place, he's going to continue instruct the nations about his father's name. One of the, um, uh, one of the prayers, so the 21 prayers is uh, number chapter six, the, the prayer, the, the blessing of Aaron. And it ends with the blessing saying that Lord, would you place your name there forever? Would you place your name with them forever? Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse four, it says, he also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And you have to think about John 17, verse 26. That has to come into play where Jesus, even in the age to come, where the name of God resides and dwell, Jesus will do what he told his father he will continue to do. He says, Father, I've declared to them your name and I will continue to declare it, that the love with which you have loved me by me and them, beloved, the earth will be filled, it will be energized with a realm of love that will fill every crevice of the earth. Why? Because the son of man from Jerusalem, he will expound again and again and again and again about the glory of his father. I mean, it is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter two. He says that the spirit searches the very 
deep things of God. Here, God is searching God. It is this Trinitarian reality of the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father and the Spirit in them both, searching them out, intimately acquainted in the Son of Man. He will a billion years later, he will blow our minds with insights about the goodness and the love and the power and the beauty and the bounty and the grace of the Father. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, Paul says this, that we've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, verse 7, so that in the ages to come he might make known the exceeding greatness of the riches of his grace and his kindness that is found in the Father. Jesus in Jerusalem, he's going to give line upon line and messages and songs and prophecies. He will declare again and again who the Father is and it will cause the earth just to be buoyant with love. In Jerusalem, it will be the instructional center where, uh, where, where Jesus will expound upon the name and the glory of his Father. Isaiah chapter two, it will be the instructional center of the earth. Isaiah chapter four, it'll be the bridal city. It'll be the city of love. Isaiah chapter 11, it will be the global justice center. Isaiah chapter 27, it will be the center of restoration. It will be the place where the kings of the earth will come and they will gain insight from King Jesus of how to bring restoration to their areas. I, I think of Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, where Jesus is talking to the Jewish people and he makes the most amazing statement. He says, remember when the queen of Sheba in 1 Kings chapter 10, how she came and she visited Solomon. She'd heard of his fame. She'd heard of his wisdom. She wanted to come and gain insight because she heard of 1 Kings chapter 4, where there was a king in Zion who had so much wisdom. He knew about birds and trees and plants and fish and beasts. I mean, he had insight into, the, in, into all kinds of environmental issues. And so, King, uh, so Jesus says, remember when Sheba came to Solomon to gain insight in terms of how she can go back to her kingdom and, and, and run things? And people go, yeah. And then Jesus goes, he goes, behold, one greater than Solomon is standing here. He goes, Solomon is only a picture of what will happen. When I, when I die, I will be buried, I'll be raised again, I will ascend to the Father, but I will come back and I will set my government in this very city. And you watch the kings of the earth. They will come to me, they will gain insight after the earth has been completely ravished and war-torn by the Antichrist. The people filled with trauma and total dissolution, I mean, the anguish that will be in the earth, the animal kingdom will be, uh, will be a complete disaster, the economy is destroyed, the nations are completely guarded and no longer interacting with one another. Jesus says, the kings, they will come to me because one greater than Solomon is standing here. Jerusalem will be a city of restoration from where Jesus will give counsel to the kings of the earth of how to take care of the fish and the birds and the beasts and the animals and the politics and the environment environment and all kinds of amazing things. Psalm 48, it'll be the city of the great king, that Jerusalem will be the global center of the earth. It'll be the joy of the whole earth. It will be the city that will, um, it will it will dominate the conversation of the peoples of the earth. And when they talk about what is going on there and what is going on with their king, it will, it will fill the earth with joy. I remember my parents are from a, a small, tiny little country called Suriname. Every time I mention this, because I want you to go Google it. <laughs> and most people don't know where Suriname is. And, but I grew up in Suriname, lived there for about seven, eight years. And I remember when I was in second grade, it was around the time when uh, Jimmy Carter was, uh, was running for president uh, against, uh, it was running for a second term against Ronald Reagan. Now you gotta picture this, second grade, playground, Suriname, small country, most of you don't even know where the place is, this is probably the first you've heard the name. This dinky little country at the time, uh, about 400,000 people live in the town, uh, live in, lived in the country at the time. Um, this kid walks up to me in the playground, points his finger at me. Who do you want to win, Carter or Reagan? <laughs> I went, uh, uh, 
Reagan. <laughs> I actually said Reagan. And because uh, I thought his name sounded nicer than Carter. <laughs> and so, and I said Reagan, and he goes, good, because Carter is a peanut farmer. <laughs> and so a second grader told a second grader about how Jimmy Carter is a peanut farmer. Here is the thing that most of you Americans cannot fathom. You did not grow up on the playgrounds talking about small, insignificant little countries. That is the power and the presence of the United States of America in the earth. What Psalm 48 is telling us is that it's not gonna end with the United States of America being the main center of the earth, it's going to be Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem is gonna be the city that is gonna dominate the conversations of the earth. But not just that, when they talk about the city, it will, it, it will ignite joy within their heart because they will, they will connect it with a, uh, with, with a very powerful narrative. Beloved, I mean, all of human history will be, be, all of natural human history will be behind us and we will see the footprint of God every step of the way and we will tell stories. I mean, a billion years from now we go, remember back in 1948? We go, yeah. Have you heard about this? I never even heard of that. I mean, we will, we will talk about so many things about Jesus' leadership in the earth related to that city, and it will just fill people's hearts with great joy. One of the reasons why the Lord is doing this is because he appointed Jerusalem to be an object lesson to the nations of the knowledge of God. Jerusalem is a witness of God's leadership. In Romans chapter three, Paul says this, he asks a rhetorical question, he goes, he goes what advantage is it to the Jews? Or what is, it, uh, uh, what is the profit of the circumcision? And he goes, much in every way. It's chiefly this, that because to them were committed the oracles of God, for what if some did not believe? What if their unbelief makes the faithfulness of, um, he, he says, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without, with, with no effect? In other words, he says, even their unfaithfulness, uh, excuse me, even their rebellion will not cancel out the faithfulness of God. God will prove his faithfulness to that city, and when he does, it will fill the earth with the understanding about the faithfulness of God. Let's go to um, paragraph E. A part of God's display to the world about himself is by what he does in Jerusalem or towards Jerusalem, both in judgment and in redemption. The nations will understand more about Jesus' character, but how he relates with that city. About 60 to 63 times, I probably should just pull out the verses sometime, but it's about 60 to 63 times in Ezekiel where it says, Jerusalem, Israel, I'm going to do these things to you, positive or negative, judgment or redemption. He goes, and when I do them to you, when you see these things happen, he says, then you will know that I am. Then later on, he'll say, Jerusalem, I'm gonna do these things to you, positive or negative, judgment or redemption. He goes, and when I do them, he says, then the nations will know that I am. Israel's called to be a witness. There's a lot of things about Israel that we uh, excuse me, there's a lot of things about the nature of God, and particularly his mercy, that we won't understand outside of the nation of Israel. Part of the problem is, is that there are all kinds of things going on in Israel right now that are not good. And part of the problem is, is people are assuming that because these things are happening, that God is done with Israel. And the Lord goes, no, don't you understand? He goes, these things must happen because I'm gonna put on display the exceeding abundance of my grace, just like I did with you. Go to page three, the condition of Jerusalem. We'll end it with this. So Joshua, he had, um, has this encounter. In Zechariah three, what is happening is that it is addressing the glory of the divine election of Jerusalem, number one, number two, and the certainty of her future. Zechariah chapter three, shows us 
the glory of God's divine election of Jerusalem, number one, and number two, and the certainty of her glorious future. And the third thing that we see is that God does not overlook Jerusalem's condition because it says that Zechariah saw Joshua the high priest, and when he saw him, he saw that his garments were dirty. His garments were filthy. Um, a clo- we're not gonna get into that, but if you wanted to look at it much closer, it's a very graphic description. It's not a pretty sight. It's not just a little bit of dirt sprinkled over you gotta put it in a washing machine. In fact, it was so dirty, God said, I gotta, I gotta give you some new clothes. The purpose of the vision was to show Joshua or Jerusalem and her condition and her calling. Zechariah points to these things. Number one, it points to the irrevocable nature of God's calling on Israel. It says in um, Romans 11 that the, the giftings and the callings are without repentance. In other words, the certainty, the calling that God put on Jerusalem is there forever. Number two of Zechariah 3 is to provide a model of how to bless Jerusalem in the midst of her present condition. How to bless Jerusalem in the midst of her present condition. Again, her priestly garments are dirty. Her priestly role, her role as a worshiping city is significantly spiritually and morally compromised. And she is resistant to the gospel. Paragraph B, when the Lord called Israel out of Egypt, he told Moses that they were called to be a kingdom of worshipers. And what happens in the Old Testament is God's interaction with Israel over and over and over again started with the issue of worship. He says, you are called to be worshipers. They said, okay, great, we're in. Well, the next thing he knows is the priests, the worship leaders, they begin to engage in false worship. The people went, hey, cool, let's jump in on the false worship. So they jump into false worship. Then the king says, you know what? Let's make laws that kind of ratifies this false worship. And the prophets are like, oh, no. And they would come and it says, thus says the Lord, you need to get with it. And they said, okay, they, they got with it. So they went back to doing the worship thing. And then they do the worship thing and then, they go back into false worship, and the people say, hey, this is a great idea. And the king say, hey, let's make laws to back this stuff up. The prophets go, ugh. Oh. And then it happens again. Well, finally, it got so intense where the prophet says, you know what? You got to go. You, you, you got to go for a long trip. To Iraq, you go. And the Babylonians came in. And when they left Babylon, when they left Iraq, the very first thing that they're tasked to do is to build a temple because the primary calling of Jerusalem is to be a city that hosts the presence of God, a place where the worship of God goes forth and from there touches the nations of the earth. So when Israel goes astray, it invariably happens around the subject of her relationship with the God of Israel. Paragraph C, Zechariah, he sees... In, uh, uh, in Zechariah chapter three, verse one, he sees Joshua. And in verse three, he sees Joshua's condition. And as he sees Joshua, he sees standing by Joshua, he sees the angel of the Lord, number one. And number two, he sees the accuser who's there ready to oppose Jerusalem. And what is happening is the accuser is, here's what he does. He is bringing up accusations to make a case for why Jerusalem is not qualified. Let's say this again. His accusations, in short, are this. He makes a case for why Jerusalem is not qualified. Beloved, he makes a case constantly about why you and I are not qualified. When it comes to Israel, he does the same thing. And this happens today, and one of the ways that this manifests it manifests in the growing false justice movement that is, that is uh, steeped in anti-Semitism. We see it in the political world, in the political arena. 
We see it also in the rise of anti-Semitism, and that's a, that's a giant subject, but the accusation, the opposition of Satan manifests itself in various ways, but it comes down to this one single sentence, Israel is not qualified because of her condition. But it's important that we remember that Jerusalem's election is not of her own moral standing or accomplishments. Her election is a matter of the wisdom and the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Again, the same reason why you and I were chosen. In Romans chapter 11, verses 9 and 16, here's what Paul says. That the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. But of God who shows mercy. And so when it comes to Israel... The accuser shows himself in several ways. However, paragraph D, one of the primary ways that the evil one operates is by putting emphasis on Israel's failure. He emphasizes Israel's failure. We hear it all the time. Hey, let's pray for Israel. Yeah, but what about these particular things? And then here comes the litany of things about that Israel probably really is doing wrong. The Lord goes, that has got nothing to do with my choice, number one. Number two, Satan's um, uh, accusations play out by leading the nations to conclude that God is done with Israel. God is done with Zion because of her failure. Or even worse, that he would have never have chosen her because of her failure. There are, there are two basic accusations that, uh, that float around, they float around some in the church and they float around within, uh, among the nations is that God is done with Israel because of her failure, or even worse, God has not chosen her because of her failure, and the Lord makes it very clear, I did not choose her because she's good, I didn't choose her because she's bad, because she's bad. I chose her because I am. But this mindset is very much so the mindset that exists within the culture. The paradigm of the culture is this, that a divine appointment is something that is earned. And that's why Paul says in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, in view of God's mercy, he says, do not be conformed to this world. This world has no grit for grace. They talk empathy, they talk sympathy, they talk compassion, they talk love, they talk mercy, they talk grace, but it is not the grace of God. They have no grit at all for the exceeding abundant grace of God that's been extended to us or the exceeding abundant grace that God wants to extend to the Jewish people. Paragraph E, Zechariah chapter 3, we see a pattern of how we can position ourselves before the Lord as believers and intercessors for Jerusalem. What we see is the, the evil one, he stands before the Lord. Here is a, a, a Zechariah, I mean, Joshua standing there probably on his left, or uh, yeah, on his right, excuse me, stands the, 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 uh, the, uh, the accuser. On his, on his right, on his, on his um, wow. Okay, on his right is, an, uh, is uh, the accuser and on his left is the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord stands there and he says, they are disqualified. They are disqualified. And the first thing that we see as a pattern is the angel of the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. But then he makes an interest, but then he says something the second time that I find interesting. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. In other words, no Satan, you are the one that's disqualified. Because I believe that part of Satan's accusation is rooted in a perpetual self-justification of why he believes he deserves to be the chosen one. And he fuels the nations with that resentment. In Psalm 48, verse two, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. 
the city of the great king. Well, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, it says, for you, talking about Lucifer, for you have set in your heart, I will ascend. I will exalt my throne above the angels of God, the stars of God. And here it is, and I will set my, and I will also sit on the mound of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. He, be, he wanted that spot. And there's resentment in his heart as to why it is that he wasn't chosen. And so he fills the earth with that same resentment. And here are the three decrees that the worship team come up. Here are the three decrees that we can decree through the Lord. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. And I'll just go about the day or sit in the prayer and I'll just say it a couple times. I say, no, God, you have chosen Jerusalem. Number one. Number two, when we make that decree, what happens is um, God will remove her iniquity and he will clothe her. When the angel of the Lord made that decree, angels were actually released to labor on behalf of the Jewish people. And thirdly, he says, I will put his name, uh, I will put, uh, he will put his name on her. That's what the turban actually represents. He says, Satan, he says, I have chosen her. She is a brand plug from the fire. He goes, I know whom I've chosen. I know her condition. He goes, I know the fire that I will put her through to prepare her, to, uh, to prepare her and to qualify her for the assignment that I put on her. He goes, I also know that I will become a man and I will die on the cross for her sin. Let's stand. Intercession for anyone, and in this case, intercession for Israel, is a response by a people who've been visited by grace. Some of you have, an, um, have experienced the, the grace and the forgiveness of God, but somehow you, um, feel disqualified. And maybe something that happened many, 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 many years ago. And for some of you, maybe something as recent as this week. You know that God forgives you. You have confessed your sin. But there's that sense of disqualification because that is actually how the evil one operates. He makes a case as to why it is that we're disqualified. Some of you, the Lord wants to, for you to release judgment that you have had against others. And to remember that God has chosen them and to release decrees over their lives that he will, that he will remove iniquity from them and he will put his knowledge in them. Just close your eyes, just begin talking to the Lord. Just take a moment. Thank the Lord for his grace, exceeding abundant grace. Again, if you, you know, you've walked away from that particular thing, you've really set your heart to wage war against it. God is faithful and just to forgive all sins, and you know that. But yet, somewhere in your heart, you've concluded that the fullness that he has for you is no longer available to you. And that's the exact same accusation that the evil one is bringing to oppose Jerusalem, because the fullness will not be available to them because they're disqualified.
But in the new covenant, the Lord, through the power of the blood, he, he confronts and he opposes the, the adversary. Tells him to back off because of the power of the blood. He says, I will qualify them. They have to say yes to me, but I will qualify them. They have to turn to me, but I will qualify them. And they'll be like a brand plugged for the fire because he goes, I know the scenarios and the disciplines and the trainings and the, and the situations that I have in store to train them and to equip them. He goes, I know the power that I possess to remove iniquity. He goes, I know the power of my name that I will put on their hearts and on their minds. Just continue to wait on the Lord. Again, the Lord just wants to touch some of you. Again, you've, you know you're forgiven, but, but you don't believe that you're qualified. And the Lord says, the fullness is still available to you. Don't listen to the voice of the accuser. For some of you, again, someone has either wronged you or you are aware of a situation and you've, you're buying into the assessment of the accuser over their lives. The Lord has a different narrative. I have chosen them. I will remove iniquity. Again, the Lord does not, he doesn't overlook the fact that there's iniquity. He says, there is iniquity and I will remove it. And I'll put clean garments on them. The prophet Zechariah, he's so moved by that vision because the Lord says, take away the dirty garments. I've removed their iniquity. And the angels, they are responding on behalf of the Lord's decree. And Zechariah, he is so moved by what he sees, he butts into the conversation. He goes, put a clean turban on him. And the angels move and put a turban on him. Some of you, you're, you're beginning to experience uh, a stirring of the spirit inside of your spirit. There's a stirring that is happening. If that's you, I just want to invite you to come to the front. I want to pray for you. There's a stirring that is happening in your inner man. It's like that Ezekiel wanted. There's a, Ezekiel saw a whirlwind, as it were. It's the movement of the Spirit. Those of you who are standing over here in the front, if you can just come a little closer to the front to make room because people are coming up. Hey, just come on over. If you're in the aisle, just come on over. There's plenty of room here in the back. Jesus is unmoved by the enemy's narrative over our lives. He's unmoved by it. It doesn't influence him at all, not even in the least. There's only one narrative that he's moved by. 
And it's the narrative that he has with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. He said, I've chosen them. I have chosen them. And I've made provision and I have a plan to remove iniquity, compromise from their lives. I will put a clean garments on them. I will put a clean turban. I will put my name on their forehead. Holy Spirit, come. Just continue to talk to the Lord. Just all across the room, let's just engage with the Lord. There's another voice. There is another narrative as we stand in the presence of God, and it's the narrative of the Son of God. I've chosen them. I've put my affections on them. Yes, I see their weakness. But as they turn to me, I will remove iniquity. I will restore, I will heal, I will empower, I will make worthy, I will qualify, grace, 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 grace. Again, there are some of you, you this is something that goes back years ago. sought to make peace with the Lord and you're walking around kind of you know feeling a little bit of peace a little bit of joy but deep down inside you have convinced yourself that you're disqualified and the Lord says no the fullness of my purpose for you is still available the fullness of my purpose in you is still available to you because it isn't about you. It's about you being a pattern of my long suffering to the many that are coming in. There is coming a billion soul harvest. The harvest that is coming in with many, 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 many unsettled issues and they need to be trained and equipped by men and women who are a witness of the long suffering and the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, anyone, because we got quite a few people here, just anyone that names the name of Jesus, if you can come to the front and just begin praying for the ones who are standing here. Just ask the Lord to touch them. number of you just to come and just to pray for the ones who are standing here.
fullness of the purpose is still available to you. Jesus. I will bring you back home. We'll bring you back home, oh my children. You will no longer roam, lost and alone in the night. The blood of Jesus, please the Lord. There is nothing. My sufficiency, says the Lord. I will bring you all back home. It's my sufficiency. Again. Though you will wander like strangers. It's my grace that enables. To the ends of the earth. I will send you safe. I will finish my work. The dream of wholeheartedness is still yours. You have no other shepherd. The dream, the call to be you wholehearted. You have no other Lord. Green pastures away. To fully live out the spirit of obedience. In Zion once more. Still yours. I will bring you back. I'll bring you back home, oh my children. You will no longer roam, lost and alone in the night. There is nothing on earth that could take you away once I gather you under my wings. I will bring. Sons of Abraham, I will wash you with water. I will offer the land. Though your sins were like scarlet, they'll be whiter than snow. I have always been with you. I will never let go I will bring you back home I'll bring you back home Oh my children You will no longer roam Lost and alone in the night 
your heart, give us your mind for your people, Israel. Give us your heart, give us your mind for your people, Israel. Give us your heart, give us your mind for your Give us your mind. 